David Butterfant, welcome to the Dylan Friend Podcast, my friend. It's been a long time in the making. I've wanted to get you in for a very, very long time. So it's an absolute honour to have you in the studio. Good on you, Dylan. Oh, it's, a, it's a privilege to be here, mate. Um, mate, we've actually known each other for a long time. Um, there's a few connections there, but obviously one being you were the high performance manager at Carlton when I was there. Obviously came over from Collingwood with Mick. Yep. Um, we had some good times. Yes. Um, you definitely tested me with a lot, <laughs> a lot of stuff. That Some of these things still live in my mind. There's yeah. a little man still talks to me a oh, lot no, stop sometimes. It. <laughs> but um, in all seriousness, mate, you've had an, an incredible um, impact on me. And I think it's, uh, we're chatting off air before, but some of the things that you know I've still taken out that I've learned from you has been awesome. So it's a blessing to have you on the show. Oh, it's very nice of you to say that, Dylan. Thank you. Um, mate, so much to get through today. And obviously your, your um, backstory and your career speaks for itself. It's so successful, so many things that you've done. Um, but I think always a good place to start is at the start. Um, mm-hmm. Young man, played two games for Richmond, <laughs> full back. Oh, midfield. Um, I was midfielder. Were you midfielder, were you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jeez, that doesn't – two games and midfielder. Yeah, I was So midfielder. were you just no defici- uh, defensive <laughs> transition back then? Or? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Couldn't find the footy. <laughs> what was, um, maybe that's why I thought you were a full back. Cause well, I, one year – I played full back at, at Box Hill for one year. Was our, our, uh, our full back actually did an ACL. So I had to play full back one year. That's the only time I played full back in my life. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, must have been very good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> finishing your footy career, yeah. I suppose that's when things really started um, yeah. working your way in your career yes was the passion always there for sports you know high performance were yeah. you studying while you're playing how did that all sort of transgress well it's interesting you know because i always had a love of sport because at a very, very young age i was involved in sport you know the athletics and football as a family and a very active family um so i had a real you know kind of intrinsic motivation to be involved in sport and really kind of fortuitously i, I had the opportunity you know to, to be involved you know at an afl level for a couple of years which is great i lo- love that um, then I became a PE teacher, uh, which loved sport, but it didn't last too long. Mine only lasted three, <laughs> three years, but it was, you know, teaching out in Broadmeadows at uh, a school called Therry College, it's now known as Benola, but, you know, I really enjoyed it. And then I really went on to do some more post-grad stuff in exercise physiology. And then basically what happened from there, I, I got exposed to elite sport. And then I had the opportunity, you know, while I was doing my PhD to get some work at North Melbourne Football Club in the mid 90s. So it's a bit of luck at the right time, right place. And that's kind of what happened really. Yeah, I, I, yeah I don't really believe in luck. I think that there is, you know, you put something in your mind and you get there. And I think that you, you're underselling that a little bit. Um, <laughs> but it's it's an incredible because I think at that stage when you were at North, yep. in early 90s, would I be wrong to say yeah. that was when Football wasn't still full time then. Was that's it, right. Yeah, was no, it still part time. No, that's right. It was probably before you were born. But uh, I started at the year ninety four, and it was part time. Yeah. I mean, you're paid part time, but pretty much you're doing your <laughs> forty, fifty hours a week. And then that was my first year. The second year, they said, look, they made that transition. Look, we want our athletes, or our players, to become more full time, more committed. Um, that was ninety six. Uh, we went full time, and really, at um, a very, very successful club. You know, they played so many preliminary finals and grand finals and so forth. So. Um, then went full time ninety six, which thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed, and you know I was very grateful for people who gave me an opportunity there. Um, Jeff Walsh, obviously, he was a footy manager at Collingwood. Um, he kind of initiated, and then Dennis gave me a wonderful opportunity too. So I'm forever grateful for the for North Melbourne Football Club. What was it like back then? I suppose that was when it was a very successful time. You had players like you know the Duck running <laughs> around, yeah. Wayne Carey. What yeah. was it like? You know working with him on a high performance level? You know, it's interesting because North Melbourne back then, you probably would remember, but they used to train underneath the, you know, the Arden Street kind of stand. And look, they were poor as church mice. I mean, yeah. really, they didn't have many resources and there wasn't a lot, of, a lot of staff, but they did have a very strong culture and they were really committed, you know. So, um, and look, really didn't have many full-time staff as well, you know. So basically it would have been... I reckon we'd have been in the football department. Be lucky to have more than six full-time um, staff in that in the very first year I started, and then and then it kind of progressed and got bigger. But really, things haven't changed. They're, they're, the same people, different names, different faces, but the same people. You know, they're they're intrinsically motivated to actually to compete, to play, you know, play the highest level. Um, footage changed enormously. The athleticism has changed, but. Still, those great athletes then would still do very, you know, very well today. And this is, this is twenty-five years later. Yeah, I, I totally agree on that. I think when you're in a footy club, you think, you know, this group's special. It's, you know, this is what's going to happen. But at the end of the day, it's yeah. it's a bunch at that time, and and you're sort of just blessed to be a part of it while you're there. Yeah, absolutely. How did the transition part take into Collingwood? Because I suppose 
David Butterfant, Mick Mouldhouse, um, you know, early 2000s to late 2000s. That was an incredible part of, you know, your public life, I suppose, when you were high performance manager of the biggest club in, in Australia. Uh, some incredible things, you know, happened. You were a pioneer in bringing um, high altitude training to, to AFL. Mm. How did that start? What was the initial conversation with Mick? Was it with Collingwood? Yeah, it was interesting because when I was at North, I had an opportunity in 98 to go up to Homebush uh, for the Sydney Olympics as um, the senior sports scientist there which I thoroughly enjoyed and lo- loved it and it was really good um, the once the Olympics finished I had four kids I wanted to head back to Melbourne so my wife and from Mel- Melbourne so I wanted to you know connect with family and friends again which is really important and when it finished actually I had a few phone calls I had a few phone calls from, uh, from different clubs but Dean Laidley contacted me and said look uh, Butters there's not, there could be an opportunity coming up at Collingwood would you, would you be interested yeah, why not? I, I, of course. So I caught up with uh, Mick Moldas and uh, Neil Baum and really just I thought, oh, this is the club I want to go to. You know, I could really sense this, uh, like a connection. I grew up in the northern suburbs. I grew up in the north. Good, you know, family of Collingwood. I, I wasn't a Collingwood supporter. Um, but I just felt a connection, you know, and I thought, no, this is a club I can I can actually move into and, and feel part of. So so Dean obviously gave me the opportunity to actually, um, you know, say, look, have, have a chat to Mick and see what they're what they can offer and uh, there could be some opportunity there so I took it well it did turn out for the better because I suppose that was a, a formidable relationship and someone I suppose you've been incre- extremely close with since um, you know working with you at Kyle and I know how tight you two were and how you know on on the same level just about things I suppose he you know put a lot of trust in you you put a lot of trust in him in terms of of players and and whatnot but I suppose that had to be built um, over time yeah what were some of the early days like I suppose and when did things start changing that like full professional way as you were saying in terms of like okay let's actually start you know pushing the limits here let's start going on some pre-season camps let's start yeah. looking into high altitude training how did this all come about yeah there was interesting i mean obviously you know cutting my teeth at north and having the opportunity to do that and then going away from football and then immersing yourself into different sports and you know looking at what other countries do as well from a sports science perspective i was able to bring that kind of collateral back into the club the great thing about mick and this is, he was so innovative. He was always open to, you know, to different kind of techniques. So quite innovative. But also too, it was kind of collaborative. You can challenge as, as well, which is really healthy. And it wasn't just Mick, there's also too, you know, Barmy did that, Walsh did it as well. They asked the right questions and challenging. It was kind of like, and that's what high performance is about. You're actually prepared to challenge one another. Um, you can talk about mistakes, but which is really healthy. So, but to do that, you know, you've got to have that trust. You've got to have that kind of, psychological safety and, and which I think we had after a while and we missed out in 2002, 2003 and winning the flag and we had to rebuild and then they were kind of open and receptive to new techniques and you know, Eddie was as well, he, he wanted to win a flag, we all did really, so what was it that we needed to do, we couldn't follow other clubs who were winning, we had to kind of break out and do something that, was, that we owned, we believed in, that's going to have an influence on shifting our performance. It's unbelievable because I think, you know, at that time, no one was doing anything like that. You know, camps had been a thing for a long yeah, time, but I suppose yeah, actually yeah. taking not only a football team, but like the high, you know, the coaches, the support yeah. staff, yeah. probably those camps, you know, I was lucky enough to go on a couple with you um, at Carlton. That was, it's nearly 50 people would come yeah, it, on a 36 six, hour trip across the world. There's always that nervousness. And I, it is just a relief when you get that plane back in the tarmac, when you land back from a trip, Oh God! <laughs> we've got everyone back. Um, you know, and I always had that element of nervousness and going there, which is, which is it's quite good for athletes too, not knowing what it's going to be like in altitude and some of the stuff that we did. It's that uncertainty, really, um, but it's in a really kind of undistracted environment. So there's risk, perceived risk as well, associated with that too. So yeah, you're right. It does. It's kind of, but in a way, that's what sport. You've got to have a go at different techniques that actually have an influence. As long as look, the central priority of the well-being players is crucial it's crucial but it, it reminds you back at you know they were first introducing ice bars at North Melbourne in the mid 90s and Darren Crocker who you know what are you doing this for butters he looked at me as I had green horns growing in my head <laughs> <laughs> and I said come on this is you know this has been going for a, you know, a long time you know it goes back to the Greeks and doing the hot bars and anyway so and we that's where we started doing the kind of the, the cold the cold therapy stuff and the cold water immersion and then obviously down at uh, uh, Kerford Road, Corey McCoonan still has a go at me at that. He goes, Butters, you were mad then, I think you still are mad, but you used to, used to get us in the water all the time. And it's really just kind of that 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 evolved. But if we don't do those things, how do we actually 
you know, improve performance and uh, go to the next level. So, I think that's something, uh, you know, looking back now that I'm so happy with it that I got to experience with you and I realise now probably the benefits of it was at the time when you're a player you think fuck why is this bloke making us do all this shit like yeah. why are we like <laughs> going out like why are we climbing this mountain why are we um, you know swimming out in the ocean at pitch black 5am yep. around Kerford Road but it is that mentality and it's making yourself uncertainty and I think that's something that I really yep. learned from you um, is the way you did things and this is probably thinking about when you first came to Carlton, you always know people from other clubs. And the one thing you'd be like, oh, what's Butters like to the Collingwood boys? And they'd say one thing, don't ever ask Butters what the session is that you're doing. <laughs> so there was this rule. Did they really? There was a rule before oh, you right. even got there that was when we do a running session, you would, you know, get everyone on the line straight mm. after. You'd mm. probably, you'd tap into your, yep, yep. your psyche yep. and you're like, boys on the line. And we'd just be standing there going, fuck. Like <laughs> what is we this? could be out here yeah. for three hours. Yeah. We could be out here till tonight. Like I don't know how long this is going to go for. Yep. I don't know when we're going to finish. I don't know how, how hard we're going. Mm. And it was the most uncomfortable feeling in the world. <laughs> so why, I, I know I probably just wrapped it up then, but why did you do that? Well, that's a really good point. Th- th- there needs to be that element of vulnerability in us. You know, and I think that when there is a kind of perceived risk and the uncertainty, but life's like that. We don't know what's ahead of us. So really that, what it can do is that you can actually conjure up, ruminate, oh, this is what can happen. And actually anxiety can come up upon us. However, when we let go and we surrender, just go f- for it, it does change your mindset. And that's how we build our resilience, you know, in a way that, okay, this is okay. And once you have that trust, then you can actually go to that next, that next level. And what it does, when you overcome that, that challenge or that adversity, it becomes a wonderful reference point. You know, when you're experiencing that real discomfort, the, you know, the physiological stress that you're feeling, how I've, I've overcome that. So next time it comes, you've been there before. Mm. So it's not foreign. So that's, why, that's how we can kind of raise the bar or build our capacity. So that was kind of like, it was a mindset, but it was also a physiological thing we're trying to change and challenge as well. Because what happens is when we know there is a kind of a, a threshold, you know, we kind of, it, there is an efficiency in us. But when we don't know, we can kind of, we can kind of break through that at times. Um, and there is a fine line as well, because you don't want to injure players, but there is that precipice. That's why it's elite. That's why it's high performance. That's how records are broken. You've got to push those boundaries at times. And really, you know, the mind and body are so closely connected anyway. So that's what we're really kind of, that's what we're doing and applying. For sure. I think that is probably the biggest thing about those trips that I look back now. And, you know, for reference, um, some of those trips we went back to uh, Arizona, yep. Flagstaff, and we climbed Mount Humphreys, yep. which is, I think, is it 6,000 feet? It's actually, no, it's about 13,500 feet. Okay. It's, it's not a three and a half. Yeah. It's, it's 3,700 meters. Something. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. was. And that was honestly yeah. one of the most challenging things I've ever done. And you could say, you know, why are they going over there to climb this mountain? It's not going to help them play footy. But that was probably more just to for our minds than anything. Of course. Of course. Like, that, was, that was challenging. And I thought that was the hardest thing I've ever done until the next day when we walked down Canyon. to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Yeah, yeah. And that was fun. That was like, I thought, oh, this would be a lot easier. Yeah. So just for reference for everyone, we 36 hours fly over to Arizona. Yeah. I think it was a six hour bus then to Flagstaff, a little town in the US. Yeah. It's snowing. Yeah. We climb this mountain. Yeah. How long would that have taken? Six hours. Six hours yeah. in the snow. Yeah. I've never seen snow before in my life. That was the first time I'd ever <laughs> been to the snow. Yeah. And the whole time we're stopping, putting, you know, high altitude. Oximeter, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and yeah, like just making just sure just. we're okay. Yeah. Um, we get up there, amazing feeling. Think, okay, good, the camp's done now. We're, we're done with this hard stuff. Yeah. Until a meeting that night, thinking we might be getting on the beers and celebrating, saying, boys, get at the bus, <laughs> 6 a.m. in the morning, we're going to the Grand Canyon. Yeah. So we get to the Grand Canyon, yeah. walk down, which yeah. we thought, you know, it'd be a nice walk. Yeah. After an hour of walking downhill, it's actually quite tough. Yeah, it's up with the quads. That took, I think, nearly seven hours to walk back up or down and up yeah, together. It's, a, it's, a, it's really at a walking pace. It's about an eight or nine hour kind of you know, return trip. That so, yeah. right now, if I look back, was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah. Because we got down to the bottom and thought fuck that was pretty tough <laughs> and then you look up and you go fuck I've got to get back up there yeah. and the whole time you're walking you could be walking for three hours and it doesn't look any closer yeah and you 
you really, really, that's when you dig deep and you have to really just think, fuck. Yeah. And I know people don't understand, they might think walking up a hill isn't hard, yeah. but it is, was the hardest thing I've ever done. Well, that, that, and that in itself, because that becomes that wonderful reference for you, is when you are exposed to challenging times again, you go back to that. And what happens is that, the, hey, I've, I got through that. I can get through the next one, bring it on. And really it is a mindset. It's kind of like, okay, I don't know what, what I'm going to feel, but you go back to those reference points. And we have reference points all the time in our life. And when you overcome those challenges and give that, you know, that, I suppose, that experience, it becomes really quite um, fulfilling, but it, it cultivates your kind of your strength in yourself as well. Yeah, the, the belief in yourself you get from something like oh, that, course, it's, it's not something that you forget. You, you know that you've done it and you've, you've ticked it off. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's, that's really important. It's like when athletes get seriously injured, you know, you don't wish that upon anyone, but it can be a blessing at times. You know, we, we can actually learn from adversity. We can turn kind of adversity into an advantage. And a bit like COVID. I mean, some people will come out of COVID doing really well. Um, they can turn it around. We kind of change our narrative around that. Just on the training camps, one more, because there's yeah. a few more camps, I suppose. You know, you did millions in your time. Yeah, yeah, you did a lot. Can you talk us through some of the camps that um, were, I think probably you thought were most challenging that you've ever been through or, or done um, with teams or even with resilience builders that you're doing now? Does anything stand out that you go, for, that, that one was the toughest camp we've ever done? Um, I'd, I'd have to say at the end of 2009 going into 2010 pre-season, I, I'd say that was a pretty tough uh, pre-season for the boys. I think that following year as well, uh, we had really tough conditions. We had minus 35 conditions. We had times that, you know, when we're climbing, you know, a hundred kilometre winds, you know, going across the saddle, which you've walked across, um, really testing. But what was fantastic to see in that, in that trip is some of the, your stronger leaders supporting the, the younger ones through, you know, really uniting, galvanising the group because they've been there, done that. Whereas the first year players, young guys have never done that before. So that it was their turn to actually, okay, I'm going to contribute. I'm going to help do some lifting here and share the load. And, and seeing that, I think, wow, because it was tough conditions, you know, hip height at snow at times, walking through that and, and climbing into altitude as well. So, I think it became, and we used that as a reference point going into, you know, the 2010 grand final. You know, we, we, we kind of talked about that a lot. Um, you know, what did we learn? And really the next day we trained in the, in the, in the dome, you know, the NFL football stadium um, for two hours. The boys trained at a really high rate and you know, high level of intensity. What it demonstrates that, hey, you did a climb for six hours, seven hours, then the next day you've trained. Now, we, you know, we played a drawn grand final in 2010, We've got seven days to turn around. This is going to be a walk in the park. Yeah. So it became a reference point. It was a really strong reference point for them. And they, I said, do you remember doing the, you know, Humphreys Peak? And they said, yeah, that was shit, but I hated it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I said, but remember what we did the next day? They said, yeah, we trained and trained really well. Great intensity. Mick got them going. Boys dropping about. And really, we, we spoke about that. I said, look, okay, you, you did that within 24 hours. We've got seven days to turn around. We're in another grand final. So basically, it becomes reference points for you when you've had challenging times. Or you go the narrative, oh, God, we're going to play another grand final, we won't be ready. So it's really that, going back to what you said before, it's that choice. We're free to actually make the choice of how we respond to, to circumstances. When a lot of people speak about that drawn grand final, after the game, I think St Kilda were actually in better shape. Like, they had less injuries, I think, than Collingwood. There was yeah. a few guys that were banged up, I think. You know, Penderbury was sick. Yeah, he was sick. Um, there was a few other guys. Yeah. You had a yeah. change in the team as well. Yeah. Yeah. So. On the, from the outside, it actually looked like you were more um, unsettled, I suppose, yeah. than what St Kilda were. Yeah. But yeah. going back now, like to hear that that was what you referenced back was the pre-season yeah. and recovery through that week to get ready. And, and it's funny because, I mean, I don't know what St Kilda did, but I know where we were at, we were very comfortable where we were at. You know, we kind of, we felt that reassurance and we had that kind of belief that, you know, we're going to go out in that game and whatever happens, we'll do the best we possibly can. And I think the players really believed that. And if they killed a bit as well, they better they were too good on the day. But on that day, we're going to do everything possibly could, squeeze themselves to the point where, okay, we're not leaving anything in the tank. And there was that kind of belief in them, you know, I think you could sense it. You could sense it in the staff, you could sense it in the players as well. What were some of the other things, I suppose, that led, do you think, to the, that success in 2010? I know there'd be a million things, but was there anything else that you think at that time you were doing differently that other people weren't doing or that, that led you a little bit better than what other people would... Sort of transitioning? 
Well, I think what it was, you know, we were building, you know, obviously from 2006, made a final, 2007, made a preliminary final. There was a whole host of things, you know, like kind of, you know, Mick had obviously got the team kind of to a position where there was a real efficiency amongst them. They, they really knew the game plan well. They knew each other. They had trust. Um, you know, I think rotations was, was was definitely having an influence as well. And was that the one that was from the hockey? Like yeah, ice hockey. Ice yeah, hockey? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so really Mick. Um, you know, he was very innovative in this whole approach, but so was Guy McKenna. You know, yeah. really in a way, we were chatting and said, Look, we've got to get him fitter. I said, Yeah, we're not going to get him fitter now. It's too late. It's, it's, it's halfway through the. He goes, Well, we'll if we don't get him fit. You know, we, we won't change their, their, their intensity or somehow we'll just you know, fall into the final or something. thing. Um, so then we looked at other sports and we came across ice hockey and they change on the fly. And we know that the frenetic pace, the intensity, the speed is high. So we thought, why don't we do that? You know, obviously that will influence our efficiency. And we started trialling it. You know, we're at, most clubs were averaging 40, 50. And, then, you know, I think in the West Coast uh, prelim, I uh, know no, the final before the prelim, uh, we had 110 rotations that day. And we, that was a drawn final over there. And then the next week we played against Geelong and we're coming up at them. And, uh, you know, they were just too good and they won. Um, but we realised that formula worked. You know, that we're able to sustain the intensity, had a positive influence on some of the players. Dane Swan's a typical example. Yep. You know, he's a powerful athlete, but just to rotate him frequently to keep his intensity levels up made it very hard for players to tag him. It's unbelievable. And I think you, I, I don't know if you'll take credit for this, but you've probably single handedly fuck the AFL's cap rotations. <laughs> I think that's probably your fault. You well, can probably put your hand up for that. Well, that, that's actually interesting. Was Kevin, <laughs> Kevin Bartley's hated it. I reckon a lot of people hated it, but, but really in why. The game was at a high at high pace, and I think for the protection of players as well. You know, I think that I mean, who really cares? You see people rotating on and off. As long as you're getting good quality of game, and you can sustain. Ne- that, that yeah, that I never understood why they actually banned it. Like, what? Why was it so wrong right. to do? Good question. I, I don't know. What, I mean, really because you were too good, like because they were too fit. Or well, the thing is, there's no research to say. Well, okay, this is is it aesthetically? We'll come out and say it's aesthetically. I, I, I mean, I'm with you. I don't know what what is the reason why. I mean, it does it. Um, I mean, really, what we found in our research, it, it actually mitigated some of the injuries because we were able to control the load. Um, you could actually increase longevity of players playing as well, you know. So now it's a, it becomes what they're hoping is decreasing the rotation. The game will open up, but things like you know decision making may be compromised. You know, skill level they can't break the lines and not as explosive. Um, is it going to open the game up? We don't. We don't know. I mean, it's kind of like they're based on inferences. It really should be based you know, on objectivity, on, on on data. This is what's happening. Okay, well, yeah. Protect the players' well-being. That's re- what's really important. But don't don't say there's, there is an injury related. There wasn't. There was never an injury kind of related kind of correlation there at all. No, and it's it's look. I, you've obviously got the um, credits to talk about this. I don't at all. But I just get really annoyed when I find sometimes in AFL that we just change a rule, and then we change a rule because we've changed another rule that has to suffice the rule that we changed in the first place. Yeah. Like you look at I think soccer for example. They've been around for a lot longer than us they've had three rule changes their whole time yeah as soon as someone gets good at something here it's like we cap it because we don't want them to like that's just what happens that's innovation that's that's yes. like what people are there to do and they will, and, and good coaching will do that they'll find methods the way to, to actually maneuver their team around that to get that that advantage and that's what they do they kind of they jump jump ahead I mean, and I don't think clubs get concerned about the rule changes so much. They tell us what they are, what, what's going to happen, so then they can start to prepare and plan in pre-season and put it into their kind of, their, you know, their, their programming. Um, I want to ask you this, and I, I hope you can give us some enlightenment because I, I do speak a lot about, you know, um, some sessions that we used to do, and I, I won't mention it again, but there was a Kerford Road one, which I will reference in another episode if you want to hear the story. I've just told it too many <laughs> times. Um, what are some of the biggest punishment sessions that you've taken um or put the boys through in in your time <laughs> oh jeez <laughs> you make me feel like an ogre like a tyrant no no but th- like, these are warranted by yeah, you they're yeah. not just for no reason they're, they're, they're very warranted yeah and really punitive i mean obviously one of the things of most clubs if you know play you know slips up then most of the whole team would go in one in all in yeah yes. kind of thing and, and, and that's great because that's mm. it. you're supporting each other I mean, really, I'm big in rewarding positive behaviour, you know, not actually acknowledging kind of <laughs> but, but there was there was some therapeutic benefits. Look, when we go into the water and it's dark, fear is upon us. Fucking oath. Yeah, this is, and this is, and what, what happens, fear, fear is natural. Like, you kind of feel it. And basically, you need to embrace it. But panic is deadly. So it's kind of like, okay, 
all right, we know what's going to be in front of us here. What do we need to do? You can get the narrative and you're feeling, you know, quite negative about it. Or, no, we're going to do this together. We're going to support one another, help one another, be team orientated and so on. So there is there is more of a benefit from that. It's not the reason someone rocked up late or whatever happened on a weekend. It's really, that's only a very, very small part of it. This is an opportunity to actually do something collectively that takes you out of the comfort zone. And by doing that, becomes a reference point. Hey, we got through that. You talk about have a laugh and you're still talking about it today. Oh. You're probably bagging the shit out of me for doing it. <laughs> um, don't worry, well, probably other hundreds of players would do the same. That idiot, what he was doing, the jellyfish and so forth. But um, look, you have a laugh and you come away, how do you feel? It's actually... It's, it's, a, it's a process you do, but the outcome is, is, is quite positive, really. Yeah, definitely. No, I, I look back <laughs> on that now, and I, I do really look back on it fondly because it is one of those things that I'll never forget. And I think something that I have, you know, gone back to is how cold it was, how dark it was. But yeah, in terms of fear, like, you are you are petrified. Like, you don't know where's, yeah. what's going to happen, and like you said, you, d- you don't even know when it's going to finish. Yeah. Um, so when it's not in your control, I think you've just got to get comfortable being uncomfortable that, that's that's exactly what it is and i think that's it's, it's a kind of a heightened level of mindfulness really doing cold water immersion and you kind of like letting yourself go it's like training at, at a high level of intensity um so what it's teaching you is, is some really wonderful benefits that you may be in a really difficult time and you're feeling a lot of discomfort but th- this this will pass you know reminding yourself of this this will pass i can get through this and it's focusing into the now when you're there okay i've got to i've got to start swimming probably more breaststroke you want to put your head on the water it's pretty cold um but yeah look i think from a punitive we, that was probably one of the tougher ones we did you know midweek stuff and you always had to kind of try and load stuff there that you, you kind of get players to do um but also mindful too you've got to look after their their, their well-being as well yeah. um i don't even point where i scar them they never come back and talk to me ever again yeah. <laughs> So I, therefore, I had to do it myself, you know. So I was never going to get them to do it, and I wasn't doing yeah, it. So. And you, and to, yeah, and to your credit, you were always actually doing these things with us as yeah, well, which yeah, was, so. I found even weirder that you'd want to do that. Well, <laughs> I kind of thought I can't get people to do it if I'm not prepared to do it myself. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm really big in congruency. You've got to walk your talk, and I think that's really important. I think not just in sport, but I think in leadership life as well. If you're asking people, you know, would you consider doing this? Well, do you do it yourself? Yeah, I do. I do invest myself into that. Huge. No, it's a, it's so true, mate. And I, I do look back on that and think that it has taught me a lot in, in my time. Um, but I want to talk about Mick because Mick is a, a, such a big figure in AFL and I think he, he's polarising. But for me personally, he was probably the, my favourite coach ever played under just because of the way he was about it. Like you knew where you stood, he was honest mm. um, and you knew what was uh, expected of you. Yeah. You you know, no one probably knew him better than you in terms of that working relationship what what do you think made him such a good leader? Gee, that's a really tough question. Um, I think he had a lot of wonderful traits, like a lot of wonderful traits in getting the best out of people. You know, I think that he was able to kind of inspire um, change in people. He understood their aspirations and their dreams. And then he knew, and, and he tr- didn't treat everyone the same. Like he knew which, which stimulus to provide at the right time for the people. And he was kind of a wealth of knowledge in a lot of other areas as well. Not just, not just football, you know, anthropology, history and so forth, military history. Um, but he had this ability to kind of get people to well, pretty much build their capacity, really. That's, that's what he was doing. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, for someone to coach that many games, you've got this wealth of experience. He's got the knowledge, he's got the experience. Obviously, that gives you the wisdom, you know, and he, and he had that, you know. So I think that um, – and, and he got a very strong constitution. And Mick walked the talk. Mm. And that's one of the things, you know, from, from family, had a really – got a really strong moral compass, um, strong values, loved his family, um, very supportive, very loyal. So it's kind of when you see those traits, you see those actions, it actually influences people. Mm. I mean, you become a byproduct of the culture you live in. Yeah. That's, what, that's what happens, I reckon. And that's, they saw it. Yeah, Mick was, uh, was firm. He wasn't going to sugarcoat things. He didn't need to sugarcoat. He was direct and firm. Your coach is there to, to drive performance, and that's what he did. I think one that, you know, just remember that speaks volumes of that was when we did do uh, Mount Everest and when we did do... Um, yeah, Mount Everest. He, no. Oh, Mount, Mount Everest, sorry. Yeah, Mount <laughs> What's it called again? Humphrey's Peak. I've blocked it out. Um, that's right. Humphrey's Peak. Yeah. He would not let anyone pass him. No. He, yeah, like, yeah. He, not that I could anyway, <laughs> I couldn't keep up with him, but he would be leading the charge. I'm not sure how 
yeah. old he was at this stage, but yeah. he would not let any of the yeah. boys pass him because he goes, I'm the leader of this team. Yeah. I've got to take them up and set by example. Yeah, yeah, he was great at doing that. Great. He yeah. was unbelievable. I know, he loved unbelievable. it. Just, just chewed it up. Um, you also co wrote a book together? We did, yes. The ox is slow, but the earth is patient. That's it. Yeah. I need to read this. What are some, what's, what's the book about? Well, actually, Mick and I, we, we kind of got together and said, look, both of us had an interesting journey. Why don't we just do a book that we can just give to our family and friends? And so we, we kind of had, we spoke to two different publishers. They said, look, that's a great idea. What, what, who's a book for? So basically for you know, players, coaches, teachers, managers, family, parents, children, whatever. I said, great, okay. So then we started putting a bit of an idea, what, what's it gonna look like? Um, storytelling, footy stuff, life stuff. And then pretty much the tools about how we can improve ourselves as well. So, and that's what we do. The tools that we've used in our own life, and our own experiences, that's put us in good stead. And also sharing stories we've seen in players and some of the things that they've done as well. So it's kind of, there's a spiritual element to it as well. Mm. So um, you have a read, mate. For a Collingwood book, it's, um, I've been told there's not enough photos in there. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I will we'll definitely check that out. No, no honestly, was, we will. Yeah, we'll we'll yeah. put that in the show notes, guys. Yeah. Well, if you want to check that out, so make sure you you get a copy. But um, mate, I think at the moment the amount of you know wisdom that you are giving us today, everyone will be all over it. Oh, thank you. Um, you spoke then about players, and I know it's a team sport. Um, I know it's about the collective, but I suppose in your role, there's got to be some players that have stood out over the time. Is, does anyone stand out in terms, you know, that, that grit, resilience, work ethic that you've been like, well, I've pushed this bloke and he just, he doesn't give up? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, you, you see different players um, and some players don't have the actual, the talent as other players. But what they do is they, they make up with that word you mentioned, that grit, you know, is that they're, they're so... They're so intrinsically motivated to get the best out of themselves. And they go off and play 200, 300 odd games. You know, they're really, they're strongly committed. Um, and they, they do everything they can to get the best version of themselves. Now, whether it's 50 games or whether it's 350 games, you see it. You see it in people. And, they, and when they first come in, you think, oh, you won't play a lot of footy. But all of a sudden, they end up playing a lot of footy. They might become all Australian, might become captain of the club and so forth. It's really difficult to highlight and identify people because it is a team sport. Um, and you've seen you see players. What is it the ones who actually can kind of get the best out of themselves? You know, it's, and it kind of that's a question I get a lot. Mm. You know, what are the traits about them? I reckon they've got a vision. I, I really think they've got a vision of where they're going, and they're prepared to cope with any kind of discomfort to get to that vision. They just keep going back to why. You know, why am I here? What am I doing this for? And they have this belief. They have a belief. They feel I'm a part of this. I can play this game. Now, there's no difference in business and people think, hey, I deserve to be here. I'm a part of it. I've done my work and I continue to push forward. So there's kind of that, that want factor, you know, and I've seen that in, in amongst a lot of a lot of players and coaches, seen in business people as well. Um, they're intrinsically motivated, but they know and they've got clarity in their vision and where they're going. They really see it. And then they just keep, keep refining it and they just do it consistently well over and over again. I think, as you said, sometimes you can be born with some certain talent. Yeah. Um, this grit, say we call it grit, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. I think that some people do know that from a younger age and it's just the way they are. They're, yeah. you know, they're brought up like that or something in, some, in them has just sparked them that way. Yeah. I don't think I did have that early days. Yeah. But I've identified now that that's what I want. Yeah, great. And I think that it is something that you can really teach and you can learn yourself. Like, yeah. I don't think it's something that you go, oh, I don't have that, I'm never going to have it. Yeah. Like, I think if you look in, you can identify things, you can look at yourself and say, fuck, I probably didn't get the best <laughs> out of myself there. Yeah. Yep. But then you start learning things and if the penny drops with you, you can sort of turn into one of those people. Yeah, that's a really nice way to put it. You know, and I think that's, and when the penny does drop, it's really being honest with yourself, really. Mm. You know, I think that's, and once you have that honesty where you're at and you think, okay, this is what I'm prepared to do to get the best out of myself. But unfortunately, the penny doesn't drop. It's really having a good self-awareness, understanding your capabilities, understanding your constraints and what you need to do to, to go to that, ne that next level. Um, yeah, it's a, it, unfortunately, some people just don't get, they don't get that opportunity. So you need to have the right people that can actually help you kind of become more conscious of, of your strengths and constraints, but also help facilitate. They're not going to sugarcoat, but they're going to help drive that performance with you. And there is some discomfort associated with that as well. 
um, what do you want? That's the question. What, what, what do you really want and what are you prepared to do to go to that next level? Yeah, yeah. No, that's the question. I think uh, you know, I'm still on that, working that out. I'm sure so many people are still working that out. But once I suppose you can narrow in on that and really fix it in your mind, you, mm. you'll do it. You will. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. It's, I mean, we're all on that journey, aren't we? We all try to find a better version of ourselves. How do we do it? What do we need to do? You've got to find the, the, you know, the recipe that works for you, not for everyone else, but for yourself and then owning up to that. But as, um, something massive I want to talk to you about, which I think will give huge context into how you are the way you are, um, which is you know, obviously determined, empathetic, and, and just so driven is something else you've done, a big factor in your life is the Nick Foundation, yeah. um, which is an incredible cause, which I've been blessed to go to a couple of concerts of yeah, yeah. Um, and be a part yeah. of. Can you, can you talk us through the Nick Foundation yeah, yeah, sure. and, and how it came about? Yeah, look, it's, um, it's a small foundation we've been going for, you know, it's coming, it's over 11 years now, but um, 11 years ago, my son took his life. Uh, he was the eldest of four kids, uh, just turned 20. Um, and it really rocked us, you know, really made it difficult for us to push forward in life. You know, you kind of just, you just get into a stage where you just want to go in a cave and hide from everywhere. But going back to what you said before, we, have a, we had a choice. And I remember saying this, this conversation with my wife, Maria, and she said, well, we've got a choice here. We, we can get better or get better with this. So we, we decided we're going to get better with this. And... Was it easy? No, it wasn't easy. Um, and I'm not saying my setback was bigger than anyone else's setback, but when you do lose a loved one and a child, it does, it really kind of, it's a lot of trauma on your family. But there was a responsibility on me um, and my family, and you were obligated to have joy in your life, and we wanted to have that. So we had to work on things and all the things that, that I subscribe to, to now, you know, today, and, um, and I've done for the last so many years, it's really helped me to get out of that pit of pain, you know, and, um, you know, and I look back and it can enrich you as well. You know, it gives you a really strong perspective of life. Um, but also too, you kind of, you get caught up thinking too far forward, but no, it's now the present. I'm enjoying this conversation with you now. Um, and I'm happy to share this, this story because I know that other families have lost loved ones as well. Um, and mental health, um, is, is on the rise. We know that anxiety and depression as well. So, you know, really basically as a family, we stuck together. I had some very strong friends that supported me as well. Um, the club were very strong at the time too, that I was you know, forever grateful for. And basically now, you know, we've had, um, we've got four grandchildren now, which is, which is lovely. A lot of things in our life that we've actually been able to achieve since his passing. And it's really that, that continual kind of moving forward and so the Nick Foundation was born from that. I had two good friends and we were having coffee. It wasn't long after Nick passed away. And I said, but I said, why don't we do something to help families or, you know, teenagers and um, parents that are dealing with, you know, kids with challenges and so forth. I said, well, what can we do? And one of them said, well, why don't we um, form a foundation? I said, man, I've got no idea what a foundation is. <laughs> what are we talking about? He goes, well, why don't we call it the Nick Foundation? I said, oh, well, okay, well, he goes, and then he came up with the acronym or Nurture, Independence, Commitment, Knowledge. I said, okay, well, what, what is it going to look like? He said, well, first of all, just get people sharing their stories. They don't have to profess to be the experts, but share their stories um, about how they've overcome their challenges in life, and that's how we started. And then we got into the performing arts area. We, we ran shows, which you've, you've seen. We had, you know, ran you know, over seven years, ran shows. Um, and now pretty much what we do is we just sponsor families, kids, um, and their parent to go on these trips with us, you know, where we take them to the Himalayas, to Everest Base Camp or Tassie, because we really believe, and what we found out, like a guest speaker's great. You go away, you feel, you, you feel warm and fuzzy and inspired. But really, you learn resilience indoors, but you actually, you build it outdoors. Yeah. Experiential. You've got to, you've got to get amongst it. You've got to get out there. And, and what we spoke about before, that uncertainty, you've got to have that undistracted, you've got to invest yourself. There's got to be an element of risk. There's got to be a new environment. Those things are really important. Then it becomes a reference point for them going forward. And then, then they can really start to develop their resilience. You talked about before, you talked about, you know, kind of Humphrey's Peak, you talked about the cold water stuff. These things that still resonate with you. You've overcome those things. Young teenagers with their parents on a journey where it's tough, it's challenging. We do activities around that. They store that, then they go off and, okay, 
because there's going to be some setbacks and challenges. That's inevitable for everyone. But what things will put you in good stead? You know, the tools that we talk about, we, we, we do mindfulness, we do a lot of reflection, visualisation, positive talk, journaling, or a whole host of things. I go on all day about it, but we don't say this is what you have to do. These are things that work. Have a go. Which ones do you like to have a go? So basically it comes down to habit formation, good healthy habits that set you up to be able to tolerate what's coming at us in life. Resilience, and it's something – you're never going to be like good at it all the time. No. I think like I, I sort of feel like I've become a more resilient person, but then something will happen. I'll be like, fuck, like I'm not resilient at that time, but it snaps me back into res- being resilient quicker. Mm. Would mm. you say it's a, it's a skill? It's a habit itself? Yeah, that's interesting. It is a habit. It's a continuum. I think it's one of those things that we have to continually do. It's not to point you get to that mountain, you're, hey, you're resilient. No, there's times you're going to feel that fragility. You're going to feel that vulnerability. It's fine. It's accepting that. But what are the things you're going to go back to that enables you to keep that momentum and going forward? That is the key. You know, that, that it's really in a way, I, I, I go back to 11 years ago, I felt like I wanted to desensitise with pain, get on, get on the piss, get on the cave. And, but no, that's, I don't want to do that because I have responsibility to myself, to my life and to my loved ones and, and to work as well. So it's kind of like, okay, um, it's that continuum of resilience is you've got to keep working at it. It's like your health and what is it works for you. So really all of a sudden, and, and, and over time, you've formed these habits. They're ingrained. It's just part of you. And then you've got those formed. Then you might think, oh, okay, I might start to get this out of the comfort zone and start applying some other things as well. If it gives you a better version of yourself and it gives you the ability to connect to yourself, why wouldn't you do it? Mm. Because I really think that we can become disconnected through pain. And then when, we, when that happens, we, we don't have the ability to connect with others. Because really, that's what life's about. It's about relationships, really. So, but I think when you have a true, a true kind of connection with yourself, you have the ability to really connect to others. So it's kind of like it is a continuum. You've got to keep working at it all the time. And it's like, does it get easier? Probably not. No. You know, it does. I, I, I have to say, like, you know, like I've been doing mindfulness now for you know, nearly 12 years, you know, and I I don't miss a beat. You know, I kind of exercise every day. But does it get easier? Not really. Do I like doing it? Not all the time. To be honest, you know, and I eat well and that's all that. But, but what it is, it's the outcome, how I feel after it. Mm. That it that's, that's the most important. And I think that's what resilience – and you're right. When you admit, I'm feeling a bit fragile today. That's okay. Then you've got to you know, have some compassion to yourself. You're kind of like, that's, that's okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to move through this. I think with resilience as well, and one thing I want to get your opinion on yeah. is – Resilience, I think, is sometimes forced for you because of, you know, an event. Say, you know, what, mm. what happened mm. with your family. Um, someone might go through something that's, you know, it sort of forces you into it and forces you to look at it and be more resilient. Is there a way that you can actually practice resilience proactively and actually build yourself up so that when bad things happen, which is going to happen, you can be better at it? Yeah. Like, can you be proactive with it? Is there studies that you can do? Or of do you- course, of course there is. It's, it's practicing these habits on a regular basis that enables you to get into the moment and not conjure up and ruminate and think what, what things are going to happen to you. What are those practices? Well, basic things like this, get good sleep patterns, eat well, do mindfulness, surround yourself with positive people that can support you, feel connected to people that, that you love. You know, show, show compassion. You know, and then also then there's, there's a whole host of things, but it's doing these things regularly, not waiting until when that shit hits the fan, you think, shit, what do I need to do? How am I going to get out of this pit of pain? What, what am I going to do? But I, I, hey, these things I've been doing, I keep doing these yeah. things. Just getting out of your bed, just getting out of your bed, moving, moving forward that day. You know, it starts small, tiny steps. You know, I think it's got to start at a young age and then it's kind of like build, building upon that because we know it's going to come at us at some stage. And, and, but we can learn. When we have discomfort, we learn, we reflect. What do I learn about that? Yeah, okay, that was pretty painful. What do I need to do to get me, out, get me out of that? So you go back to those kind of habits that get you out of it. So really, what, yes, you can, yeah. you can build resilience. Yeah. You definitely can build it. And I think it's, but we have to practice it. Um, is it easy practice? Not, not necessarily, but it's good. you've got to be able to do it regularly it's consistency of doing it all the time um i think it sparks something that you said a few times when people are trying to build habits in good habits in yeah. yourself yep. you go from people who maybe don't do a thing you know don't practice anything they don't have a routine yep. but then they go you know what next month i'm gonna go to the gym every day yeah and it sort of falls away because it's it's unattainable you yep. can't keep doing that yeah um i've heard you say something really cool about 
try and start one good habit a week yeah. and then the next week build on to two good habits. So yeah. it's a slower, yeah. you can start small and build Start them. small. What, would you, what advice would you give to someone on that? Look, we're really big on-, on And sorry, this is through Resilience Builders. Yeah, yeah, so yep. basically that's what we do. We teach online, you know, to corporates, to schools, um, and then, you know, we do face-to-face stuff as well. But this, this is basically what we're talking about, micro behaviors, habit formation, how we actually instill that into people. First and foremost, I think what's really crucial, you've got to understand why. Why, why do you want to do it? I mean, really, I mean, I was dealing with a banker uh, three years ago, and he's going to the Royal Commission, and I was, you know, he says, oh, I sleep terrible, brothers. I said, how many, how many hours a night would you be sleeping? Four hours. I said, no, <laughs> okay. I said, why do you want to get better sleep? Oh, I just feel shit out all the time. And I come on, why? And then he says, oh, I've got no idea. I just need better sleep. I said, you come back and find out why. And he come back and told me, he said, I want to become a better dad. I said, how's that going to help you? I've got more energy, and I can connect with my kid. I said, there you go. I said, there's your why. So once you know your why, and this is not my quote, mm-hmm. this is Frederick Nitschke's quote, once you know your why, you can bear any how. Now, Simon Sinek talks about it as well, but it's so important. It goes back to your vision. What, why do you want to do it? Okay. What Then you go through, okay, if you get better sleep, how are you going to feel? I feel more energized. Great. That's a good outcome. Okay. So what are your obstacles? Phone's going off all the time. Okay. What do you need to do? I'll put it in another room. Can you do that? Yeah, I could do that. Okay. So could you achieve four hours to four hours, 15, an extra 15 minutes? Yeah, I could do that. Slow, small. Small, small little tiny increments. And then once you start to build those and you go, because you're right, try and go to gym every day. Cognitively, it's just too hard, it's too arduous. So you've got to make, make the steps small. Then you piggyback the good habits against other habits. Now what I mean by that, that just is a cue and trigger to enable that habit to form. So for example, in the morning you get up, what do you do? Check your phone. Yeah. I don't know, a lot of people do that. What do we do that for? Get out, put your feet on the carpet, say, hey, it's going to be a good day for me today. You know what I mean? Yeah. Have a glass of water, do five push-ups, whatever it may be. But that's a habit. We don't even know it. So really in a way, it's how we, we form, we piggyback habits against good habits. So, so basically, his habit would be, when he goes to bed, put that phone in another room. Right? And use an, an old kind of fashioned alarm clock if you need be. So it's got to be low friction. Now what I mean by low friction, it is a low friction so you can actually form that habit quite effectively. So... Netflix has done it well. What happens at the end of the episode? What does it do? Starts again. Of course. It's low friction. Makes you want to watch the next episode. When we're forming habits, it's got to be low friction. So repetition is important. It's got to be piggyback with something else. You need to reward yourself. This is really important. When you do it, you need to reward yourself. What is the outcome going to feel like when I've done this? When I've done this exercise? You visualize the outcome. You're going to feel more energized, feel good about myself. Okay, then you need to be conscious of what things like obstacles, they're going to actually block your way. That's really important. You've got to be realistic. Don't, it's not just positive thinking. No, it's, you've got to actually think of what are your obstacles that are going to stop you from actually achieving that. So I would recommend if anyone forms a better habit, it might be saying, okay, I want to get more water into me throughout the day. I have one extra glass of water a day. Start with that and you build upon that. Success builds success. There's no question. And then we start to form these habits regularly, whether it's mindfulness, whether it's exercise, having less sugar, um, less alcohol, whatever it may be. We've got habits we don't even, we don't even conscious of. We brush our teeth twice a day. Hopefully you do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I think we do that regularly. It's like mindfulness. Why wouldn't you do that twice a day? We look after our teeth. Why wouldn't we look after our brain? I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it, it's one of those things, it's forming these habits. Mm. We do it. And it's compound interest over time, that consistency, over time we make these adaptations and positive benefits. So really, I think the habit formation, we, it, we, New, Year's Eve, New Year's Eve kind of resolution, we kind of everyone's talking about what are you going to do, bucks this year, you know, you're gonna, okay, all right. But it's sticking to it. You need some accountability as well. That's, that's really yeah. important. You need some accountability. And if you've got some support around you too, you know, that, that will help as well. So there's kind of a... a there's a whole process of steps that enables you to actually develop these habits. There's some really good behavioral scientists that the research shows strong support in forming these habits. BJ Fogg is one, you can probably check him out. Uh, I think Wendy Wood's another one as well. There's a lot, forming these habits, these are researchers have shown what are the sequences you need to do or the process you need to do to be able to stick a habit. I, I love it. I think the biggest thing that resonates with me in that, and I think, people need to take on board is the fact that you do start small yeah. start small and and 
when you do one, you'll feel so good about yourself. Yeah. And then you, because you've done it, if you chop off too much and try and do 10 things in a day, you'll probably have the reverse effect. You won't get the 10 done, you'll feel shit, then you just give up. <laughs> of course, because that's, that's when we start to self-sabotage ourselves, the negative talk. But when you, when you start getting success, you go back and reflect, what did I do well there? Great. What could I actually do to get better here? So you start to ask these kind of self-coaching questions. And all of a sudden, hey, I've got this nailed. I'm actually doing well. It does take a little bit of time. Probably takes about two months to actually form a habit. But it does, it's no different than forming a habit like talking positive to yourself. Mm. Smiling to your colleagues more regularly. You know, do you smile to your boys? Or, yeah, Always. Hopefully. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you know what I mean? That, that's a habit. Posture is another one. How we, the speed that we eat. All the little things, that, it's being conscious of what you're doing and i think that's and that's really once we start become conscious of that all of a sudden it's like, oh okay i can do it if it becomes arduous and it's cognitive energy you're using all the time geez it's gonna you're gonna drop off i think speaking of habits and one that you reminded me of that honestly I've, this has probably been a big factor that you've helped with me is my language and the way i not that i talk but i talk to myself right. and i always say something you know i was really bad at this as a kid but i'd be like oh fuck this i can't do that yes but now whenever i do speak to myself i'm there and my fiance justine really gets angry at this because i'll pick her up on it as well because it helps me then Mm. you know reform the the habit is i'll say like i'm not there yet i'm not doing this yet i i haven't achieved this yet instead of saying i'm never going to do this yeah i love um and that's something with the language side of things. And even it's so formed in my head now that I'll hear someone say something and nearly want to, it just hits me again in the head, but I won't pull them up on it, obviously, because no. that's the way that they want to do. Yeah. But just that language and the way you talk to yourself, like being your best friend, um, it's something that I've looked into is like, you know, treat yourself the way that you treat your best mate. Well, if that's you, right. Yeah, that's if your best mate's saying, fuck, I can't do this, I can't do it, what are you going to do? You're going to say, mate, you can do this, you yeah. can get it done. Why would you speak to yourself like that? We would never speak to your best friend like that. Mm. Well, what a great point. I mean, I think that's the thing is that we, we can really hijack ourselves with the narrative that we use to ourselves. But your closest loved ones, you wouldn't be telling them, man, you're shit at that, you can't do that. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? And, and so really that is a habit in itself. So the key is really is checking in and catching yourself. That's it's self-regulation. It's catching yourself before, hey, I'm talking quite negatively. How do you get into that moment and anchoring into the moment. So what do you do when you get to the point where, hey, I'm talking a bit of shit about myself here, what do you do to stop that? Well, I, I think now it's a, a habit that I can catch it out. And I think, don't get me wrong, there's always times where I'm gonna be in a shit mood, but I get into it quicker mm. and then I can snap back. And as stupid as this sounds, and it, it does sound stupid when you say it out loud, but you just start saying to yourself like, mate, you're a legend. <laughs> yeah. You're actually really, you know, you're really good. You are, you know, you can do this. Like you just actually pump yourself up. And it's funny how quickly you change back into it. And sometimes you just laugh. You just go, oh, fuck, what am I doing this for? But it mm. does just snap you out of it. And you say, yeah. mate, like, you know, you're a good bloke. You've got good mates. You you know, you're a good friend to this. You're a good partner. Yep. Um, and, yeah, it's, I adapt that thing of being my own best friend and being able to mm. not rely on someone to snap me out of it, but I can snap myself out of it. No, I like that. I think that's – I can sense there's an element of gratitude coming in there. You know, yeah. I think that – and you start to kind of love yourself. I think that's really important. I mean – you know, if we're suffering in our world, you know, and we kind of, we haven't got our backyard sorted, how do we expect to get others sorted? You know, exactly. so we've got to have, we have to love ourselves first to, to get that. And it sounds a bit cheesy, but really that's what it is. You, you've got to be gentle on yourself and you've got to look at the things you're doing well. Um, because if you keep compounding the negative, it will manifest. If you think, actions. say negative things, negative things are going to come. And that's one thing I've definitely yeah, learned. You yeah. are what you attract. Yeah. Um, if you say good things are coming, good things will come. But if you say shit, things are coming. You know, people always say like, and you know this, this is like footy, you go, fuck this, this shit's coming. Well, that that's gonna, that's gonna come to you. But if you sort of look at it positively, then the yeah. positive will come yes. back. Yes. Um, but as I want to do some more sessions at um, Resilience Builders. Yes. How can we get involved with it? So okay. can, anyone today can actually- Yeah, anyone. So yeah. Uh, resiliencebuilders.com.au. Um, That'll be in the show notes as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So look, what, what it is, it's, um, yeah, so we've got a group going to Tassie, you know, in April, but unfortunately that's sold out. We've got one in, in uh, um, 
early August in the Overland. That's sold. That's sold out as well. So I <laughs> know oh, it's it's just. It, I think once COVID's out, it's just gone. Yeah, bananas. But um, we're gonna we're gonna actually roll one out in, down in Tassie Crater Mountain in September. So that's that's gonna. I think that's online now. Um, and then we run our online stuff. Um, then face to face workshops, and we do we do a lot of one on one coaching too with people. So, so yeah. teams, corporates, yeah. businesses, yeah. individuals can all go to this. Yeah, of course. that one in September. Talk with like what would you actually do on this, that camp? This will probably this will because we're getting a lot of interest for families. So right. like a mum or a dad with a teenager, like thirteen years up upwards. I mean, look, that could be 22, 23 years of age. Really good because you're in that undistracted environment. They're not on the phones, which which is wonderful. You're connecting with other people as well. You're doing things that you probably wouldn't have done in the past. You're going to do some cold water immersion. We we'll do a lot of mindfulness there. We do activities at night where you start to search yourself. You really go into an environment where you're going to lose your mind, but find your soul. Now that's a cliche, but it's kind of like, but it's true. You kind of when you're and crowd, Tassie's beautiful. Crowd Mountain is fantastic. When we do our trips in Himalayas, the first two or three days, some of the teenagers, this sucks. Why is that? Oh, no Wi-Fi. But the fourth day, they're talking to other parents, talking to other kids, and they're immersed. They're in that undistracted environment. They're invested into that. It's a new environment. Um, there is a perceived risk as well. But obviously, you know, the health and safety is our number one priority. We've got to make sure we get them to that point where there feels that kind of perceived exertion, or perceived risk. And what happens, that becomes a reference point for them. You know, so we do some assessment as well on them, on, on, the, on the mum and, and the dad and, the, and their teenage child as well. And that becomes a reference point for them going forward too. So it gives a little bit of rigour and objectivity around where they're at too. Unbelievable, mate. I think I couldn't urge people to go on that more because we were chatting off there before about resilience builders and what it's about. And I think all the things that you know I've been blessed to learn about in this space have mm-hmm. come from these trips. And yeah. it's nearly doing a, a pre-season camp objective, but for you know an everyday family. Yeah, and this is this becomes like I took my teenage daughter on this trip to the Himalayas and we took, went to the Everest base camp. We did some climbs above. Uh, base camp I would have to say she, she may listen to this but I think life changing for her I had I had a niece I had a nephew on there as well there's a group of 26 27 people on this trip it becomes a wonderful reference point and I, that's where I'd, I'd love to get you on one of these trips love to. Yeah. yeah you know so and we can go high if you want you know we can get you into the into the death zone if you're interested. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that's like uh, getting high. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah. think, you might think, but what are you doing to us? But um, no, seriously, I think it, it really what happens. It you, we kind of we get caught up in in the, in the everyday kind of lifestyle here. But when you're over there, and our Sherpas, um, you know, they're just they're so altruistic. They're so giving. It just um, it, you come away and you think, oh, that was a fantastic experience. So we can't wait to get back in, over there. Once COVID's kind of, you know, been under control, we'll, we'll get over there maybe later this year or early next year. It was the one thing I think when I played footy that I thought, oh, you know, I finished footy now, I'm not going to have to exert myself ever again and feel, you know, put myself in these positions where I feel depleted. But now it's the one thing I probably miss the most, you know, like it's yeah. that, that feeling of actually being vulnerable and being like, oh, I actually have nothing else to give. So what do you, what's, so, okay, so what's, what do you do now to get yourself out of that comfort zone? What, what do you, what do you do as a regular routine thing to squeeze yourself? What, what do you do? I think the one, the only thing I do that's physical is I go to the gym, but I, there's no way I'm working as hard as I was when I was playing footy. But the one thing I do challenge myself in now is my work ethic in my work, mm. I feel like I've never worked harder in my life. Mm. So that is the exertion I get. You know, like people might think this is just a podcast mm. and we record it, we press play and not, but there's probably a million other things that go on, you know, behind closed doors. But mentally, I've probably, I'm in a very good space, but there are some things that I definitely would like to, to click on to. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's, and that's what it is. It's kind of finding what things can you do that takes you out of the comfort zone because if we always want comfort we're going to get despair there's no question there's no question on that you know it's the harder choices in life will give you an easy life easy choices will give you a harder life so it's kind of that's not I heard Tim Ferriss say that so I'm just copying his quote but I, I do subscribe to that adversity element so whether it's cold water immersion having cold showers on a daily basis whether it's meditation whatever it may be getting yourself you've been there you've experienced discomfort why wouldn't you go back there again? Mm. Just keep doing it because it translates back into what you do in your business and in life. Start thinking about what can you do now to build 
a different version of Dylan Buckley. It was funny you say that now because I was actually speaking to Sam before and he asked me a few questions about you and we were chatting and I said, the one thing I actually still do, and I don't even remember, think you might remember you telling me this, but after dinner, you'd tell me to go for a walk. Yeah. And when I go for a walk, don't wear a jumper. So in the middle of winter, yes. you know, like don't wear a jumper when you go out because that little percent you might get yeah. of the walk, you might get 1% more if you're cold and then your mind knows that you've been cold so you're going a bit more. Good on you. Well so done. now That's when good. I like go out for dinner with Jazz and she's like, you know, bring a jumper and I'm like, nah, I don't need a jumper. Yeah. I, I still do that to no, this day. This is, and that's what it is, is you're conscious of the cold. We can create a narrative around the cold, but no, that's okay. Because you know that sometimes you can get warm again. And really, this is a for, the heightened level of mindfulness. And I really think that it does help us because when, dis, when discomfort is upon us, we can get a narrative that can magnify the discomfort or we can actually, we, we, we acknowledge it, but we let it go in and go out. So good on you for doing that. That's great. Yeah, you know? there's, there's definitely a few that, that are in the head that will definitely come to me. But um, yeah, but as I honestly can't thank you enough, mate, for, no, for coming on the mate. show. No, um, I employ, uh, implore anyone to to really check out um, Resilience Builders. And mate, I'm definitely coming on one of them soon if you don't sell out um, too I'm quick. I'm squeeze you on, mate. We'll make sure we, we do because I'd love to, to go. Um, I might bring my dad along as well. And yeah. um, that'd be good. And then also anyone else who wants to know, please check out the Resilience Builders um, website and, yeah. and, um, and get on a trip. Good on you, Dylan. And, and well done to you, mate. It's always great to see past players that find a passion. I really, mm. I, I mean that. Because players, you know, I still keep in contact from North days, but I see they've actually got a passion and they're fulfilled. And I can see that in you. Um, and it's, it really, it touches me because I think footy is a vehicle to set you up for life. Mm. And when you see actual players actually finding something that they love doing, it's really gratifying. So, so well done to you, mate. Thank you, mate. I couldn't have done it without your support, so thank you oh, very much. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah. This episode of the Dylan Friends Podcast is brought to you by Dr. V Energy. Alrighty, my friends, I want to let you in on a little secret that's been keeping my body feeling bloody fantastic throughout the week. It's Dr. V Energy Drinks. After a big gym session or after I let my hair down on the weekend with a few friends having a couple of cordials, I drink Dr. V Energy Bender Mender to help me recover, bounce back, and get back to performing at my best. I'm telling you now, there is no artificial ingredients in sight. It's 100% natural and made with wild herbs and berries that have been used for centuries to heal and protect the liver and kidneys. The ingredients are even hand-picked from a Siberian forest, I kid you not. You do not get more wholesome than this, my friends. Bender Mender is available at Easy Marts, independent IGAs, or online at www.drv.com.au. Use the promo code hashtag DylanFriends for 15% off the online store. So be better and drink Dr. V with me.